share audio. Welcome, folks. It looks like we're going to get started.
Good morning, Rosana. Good morning. It's such a great morning that I thought my presence would speak for itself, but here we are officially and welcome to everyone and thank you for your patience as we get started and roll with the uh, introductions to the program. There are a few things going on by way of the logistics and really quick, I'm gonna pass that to Adriana so that she can go over those pieces and then we'll officially, officially get started. Buenas tardes. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic to Alejandra to share a little bit about the translation uh, before we get going. Alejandra, if you are able to speak. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, just some notes uh, on interpretation. Um, eh, hola a todos. Eh, algunas notas sobre la interpretación. Um, I'm gonna give this uh, message bilingually. Voy a dar este mensaje eh, bilingüe, primero en inglés y después en español. Um, first in English and then in, in, in Spanish. Um, we will have interpretation via, a, a, we opened up a conference line. Um, that number is 732-434-3412 and I'll post it on the chat. Um, it, Abrimos una línea de interpretación por teléfono eh, y ese número es 732-434-3412. Eh, y este, para, para, para poder accesar la interpretación, eh, les pedimos que marquen al, a, la, a la línea del teléfono. So to be able to access the, the interpretation, if you, you will call um, that conference line um, and listen to the audio uh, from the phone um, and watch the video um, on, the, on the computer or whatever second device you might uh, have access to. Eh, y entonces, ¿cómo va a funcionar? Es eh, cuando necesiten interpretación, escuchan la línea del teléfono. Si, es mejor tener, si tuvieran por ahí eh, un par de audífonos, uno para, 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 para el teléfono eh, o poner en, en mudo o, o silenciar más bajo el, el audio del video. Um, so we recommend ideally to have two sets of headsets. Um, one would be uh, uh, plugged into the phone. That way when your uh, non-dominant language is being spoken, you can um, listen into the interpretation um, and then either lower the volume a bit uh, on, the, on the computer platform or, or the wherever you're receiving your Zoom feed from. Este, and a few notes uh, on how to co-create a um, uh, uh, bilingual space. Um, in order for me to be able to uh, keep up with the interpretation, uh, we're, we're, we have so we're, we're gonna ask uh, speakers and presenters to speak um, at a pace uh, at a pace where uh, interpreter can keep up. Um, and we if we find, uh, folks uh, speaking a little too quickly for us to be able to keep, keep up, we'll do this gesture. Um, and sometimes it's hard, especially on Zoom, um, to, uh, to, for speakers to see, especially if they're reading something or something. Um, so we might also try chatting, but um, mostly please, uh, just uh, uh, an effort to please uh, be aware that we're co-creating this uh, bilingual space together. Este, y en español, eh, algunas pautas para las personas que están eh, eh, presentando o, o que van a hablar. Eh, les pedimos que abren a un paso moderado para que les intérprete se puedan eh, seguir, seguir el, el, el paso. Eh, tenemos este señalamiento que hacemos cuando alguien va muy rápido, eh, pero hemos encontrado que en Zoom eh, muchas veces este, es difícil que la persona que esté hablando eh, lograr la atención. Entonces, si, nos ve, si me ven hacer esto, eh, Les pedimos que quizás si lo pueden hacer conmigo también, a lo mejor eh, capta un poco más de atención o también vamos a intentar eh, mandarles mensaje individual. Eh, luego pedimos también que solo una persona hable a la, a la vez para no, no tener que priorizar eh, la voz de una persona sobre la otra. 
Um, so we also ask that only one person speak at a time, so we don't have to prioritize one voice over the other. Um, and uh, we ask uh, that you speak uh, uh, at a higher level, level so that we can uh, get to hear clearly what, what, you're, what, what folks are speaking. Uh, y pedimos también que hablen uh, a un volumen en, lo, en el que les podamos escuchar eh, para poder claramente escuchar y poder interpretar lo que está eh, siendo presentado. Eh, y voy a repetir la línea de interpretación, es siete, es 732-434-3412. Um, and I'll repeat, the, the interpretation line is 732-434-3412. And I'll post it again on the chat. Um, and if uh, this uh, event is being live streamed, I would recommend to post it along with the, with the live stream so folks can um, have the possibility of accessing the interpretation as well. Eh, y si este evento está siendo... Eh, eh, es, está por live también en, en Facebook, les recomiendo también poner la línea de interpretación eh, eh, en, el, en el Facebook Live para que la gente también lo pueda accesar por ahí. Y eso. Adriana, it goes right back to you to get us started with the program, and then I'll take the mic from you from there. Buenos días a todos. Eh, me llamo Adriana García. Uh, my name is Adriana García, pronouns she, her, ella, and ye. Con mis pronombres de ella, ye. Um, me, me toca la, la, la gracia. Um, con el amor de poder presentar nuestro grupo y nuestra coordinación para hoy. I'm so happy I can, can do this for you, this introduction. It's a full of honor and love. This series is being organized by the San Jose Chicano Moratorium Resistance Council, made up of individuals and organizations in San Jose and the South Bay, standing against the war, standing up against state violence and repression, and in solidarity with all human rights struggles from Black Lives Matter to the undocumented and migrant rights movement to local and global South indigenous struggles to international solidarity. Organizations involved include the Black Berets of San Jose, Barrio Defense Committee, Centro Chico Mostoc, Maí San Jose, and Taller Girasol. Our vision is a San Jose where Raza has economic stability, educación del pueblo, education from the people, access to all forms of education as a human right. We have the right to grow old in the place that we were raised and our ancestors have contributed. A community where young people know who they are, culturally, spiritually, and politically, and understand that we have a direct role to contribute, contribute towards that. A community that takes care of its safety and takes action. A community that has its own institutions of culture, governance, and history. If you can uh, take an opportunity to do a social media check-in, uh, we have the Facebook uh, Maiz uh, page that you can share with friends and comunidad. Our hashtag is gonna be uh, 50 uh, CMSJ, hashtag Chicano Moratorium, uh, or hashtag uh, San Jose, um, Chicano Moratorium. And of course, I would like to introduce um, our wonderful MC for today. Rosana Alade is a multidisciplinary artist and social entrepreneur who lives poetically while sharing her life lessons as an educator, writer, and consultant. She's the co-founder of Eastside Magazine and the creator of Hala Chingona Podcast. Check out that podcast. Her life's work is grounded in her mission to embrace personal power through creative inspiration, which has inspired her to found Citlatli Rose, a brand committed to elevating culture, Chicana feminisms, and intergenerational conversations through art. She's also a danzante with Carpuli Iscali, and she currently serves on the boards of Yauli and La Raza Historical Society of Santa Clara Valley. Please help me welcome by uh, snaps, uh, aplausito, even though you may be a mute, or reactions on your Zoom handle. Gracias, Rosana, for helping uh, write this ship today. Gracias a todos ustedes. It's an honor to be here among such a tremendous audience alongside the speakers that are presenting today. 
Um, and celebrating our cultura during these times is, is important. And it's important for our youth to understand that we come from this place and that there is a history and a legacy for them to um, step into their own poder. And so it's, it's an honor to be here and emceeing slash co emceeing with y'all for the day. So um, in the spirit of our traditions, let's, let's take a gentle breath and ground ourselves and remember that we are settlers in occupied Ohlone territory here in San Jose, better known as the Tamian area. It's our responsibility uh, to begin in solidarity with the original earth stewards of this land. And we humbly do this event as we live in comunidad with the original caretakers who love and respect this land. We too demand the liberation of our indigenous siblings through economic and land justice. And having their basic human rights met, such as housing, health, food, water, and education, free from state violence, and so much more. And at this time, I would like to uh, open up the, the mic to Elisa um, to just share a, a little bit about that, that spirit and that energia with our audience today. Elisa, are you there? And Elisa, it looks like you might be muted. Yeah, touch the little onion. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We can hear you. Okay. Adelante. Gracias. Bueno, uh, gracias por este honor. Um, hoy doy, pido la bendición. I ask for blessings of creator. I ask blessings of creator, creadora, of Dios, Diosa, all creation that has brought us together and brought us to this time that we could stand in a circle, even if it's through the internet like this virtual, but we're able to stand together and remember this day that 50 years ago, our relatives, many of ourselves marched for justice and for an end to the war, for peace, for an end to violence. I'm going to give a brief um, blessing and call the four, the energias of the four directions. Primeramente, al este, the east, the energy of newborns, children. Creator, bless the children that have that will carry forward this legacy of struggle that is the Chicano movement. Bless them and protect them from violence, protect them from police violence, protect them from all the dangers of the streets. We give thanks for the children that are in our lives today. La children that may be here with us today, participating in this honoring of the 50th anniversary of the Chicano moratorium. Creador, creadora, fill us with love and awe of the energy of children. And to the West, el rumbo de las mujeres. Creator, I ask for blessings of all the women, the mujeres who were there that day who may have suffered, whose children may have suffered, whose aunties may have suffered, whose grandmothers may have suffered. May their suffering not be in vain. And may we carry forward a lesson of the power of women and importance of women in the, in the movimiento, in the work of bringing about peace in our communities and health in our communities and happy united families in our communities. I also acknowledge the diversity of gender of those who identify as female and walk in, in a different way uh, in their sexuality or their gender. Creator, in this moment, I also give thanks to those women who here in San Jose were leaders and helped mobilize people to participate in the Chicano moratorium. Ernestina Garcia, presente. Sofia Mendoza, 
Presente, and all the others who were part and continue to be inspirational models for us as women. Creador, creadora, I ask for blessings from the energies of the North, the place of elders. And I ask for blessings for all of the medicine people, the curanderos, those who have kept alive this knowledge and these traditions, these medicine ways. And may that grow in, in its importance to the Chicano movement. That's something that has evolved and it's really beautiful that we have an even stronger understanding of ourselves as an indigenous people. Give thanks to the elders who were leaders that day, who were protectors that day, who got us there and got us back home. Also give thanks to those who were, who have carried forward the lessons from the Chicano moratorium in the communities here in San Jose. And then to the South, Creator, Creadora asked for the blessings of the energies of the South, the place of young adults, that energy that of leadership, of courage, of willingness to take risks that in ways that will help the people. And I pray that we continue to grow in our ability to do intergenerational work in our ability to collaborate between generations to bring about a healthier and more peaceful world. I give thanks for the young adults that are part of this council that have taught me so much. I feel very, very grateful to them. Blessings to them and their families. Oh, Mateo. The tree of life that is in the center, that which unites our highest self and our self that walks on the tierra. May there be an integration, may there be peace in the center, in our heart, where we're able to bring together all the different realms of who we are as an individual, as a family, as a community, como un pueblo. I give thanks for that knowledge of the tree of life. I mean, may we carry that, maybe we be, we be centered with our roots deeply in the wisdom of our antepasados, but why we reach up for a better life, for luz, for conocimiento, for a, a life without violence, in a life where all have access to what they need to live well. Oh, Mateo, gracias al creador, creadora. Thank you. Oh, Mateo, gracias. We acknowledge that our palabra in this opening blessing is not enough, pero we believe in authentic relationship building and consciousness raising to get you us to a place to where we all stand together in unity and true solidarity and complicit allyship for the liberation of indigenous peoples locally and around the world. Because even as settlers and allies, it means so much to be in the struggle of indigenous peoples as it is to be in the liberation of all peoples. So we invite you to be present, to be in community, to introduce yourselves in the chat, to name your pronouns and your location if you feel comfortable doing so. And know that this event is being recorded and is being streamed on Facebook Live. You might see additional protocol reminders in the chat in the interest of time. But we are using the chat feature to make sure that this is a community space. And we do have a tech team that, you know, is playing multiple roles in the background in order to provide us with that assistance. Because the ultimate goal here is for us to garden together, to place ideas in these collective spaces with intention and capacity for them to grow and live so that we can thrive. And as part of our community agreements, we will be respectfully interacting and participating here gracefully, um, knowing that technology is, is our saving grace in the moment, but it isn't always our best friend. 
we're open to learning, open to hearing ways to get involved. So if you've got information to share, to share, please do that in the chat. We're aiming to foster an environment of appreciation, gratitude, et cetera, while holding our critical lens to improve our work, our organizing, our comunidad, our health, and our quality of life. And at this time, we would like to share some brief footage of the Chicano Moratorium from a short film, which can also be found on YouTube. We will share the link in the chat box so that, you know, for ease with this technology, you can copy and paste and save that and, and view over and over and share with others. Gracias. Before, the people were divided very much, especially during the Pachuco days. Chicano would be fighting Chicano. Now I see unity. Like now you can go from one barrio to another and your brothers. And this is really beautiful to see people united and fighting for the same cause. The Brown Berets evolved out of the movement in the Chicano community for social justice. The Brown Berets are a community organization that give new pride to Chicano youth and that educate all the people in the barrio on their social and political rights. Of over 20,000 people in the march, more than 7,000 remained to listen to musica and speeches from various Chicano community leaders. We are a bronze people with a bronze culture. Before the world, before all of North America, before all our brothers on this the bronze continent, we are a nation. We are a union of free pueblos. We are Atlan. Cuando me dicen que a revolución de pie a mi raza con mucho A block east of the north end of the park, there is a liquor store. A few people were walking out of the store without paying for their merchandise. Somebody called the police. The younger kid came back with the police, two more squad cars. They pulled up right together and they were the ones that they had their sirens and the lights. Another car pulled up and all the, all the, the police that were across the street had shotguns. And right then and there, I saw a bottle. At this point, there was a small crowd of people reacting to the overpresence of the police. The police had a choice of coming to the platform, using our mic, and asking our Chicano leaders to calm the situation, or to bring in reinforcements and to clear the whole park. Their answer was quick and without hesitation. because I'm afraid of the police. I met a lady about 53 years old, and I told her I said, move because the police are coming. The lady wanted a see. So I went to the first house, and I stood at the porch there. And a police officer came and beat her up with a baton on the head, and that lady just went out like a rag. So then I started yelling, so they wouldn't beat any no more because Two or three officers and time, sometimes six would get a boy and they were beating him up. And then they would go and get somebody else. And the, some of them, they would take him away. But that lady, they just left her there.
So we share that segment to give you an idea of what happened that day. And we also want to honor today as we stand in solidarity with BLM that today, August 29th, marks the March on Washington organized by Martin Luther King Jr. And their struggle for civil rights and eventually to pass the voting rights uh, that something Chicanos have, have benefited from as we attempt to practice democracy in a nation that has so many times denied our right to access that. And now we would like to introduce the first of two guests who will share some more context about the moratorium. To share some history of what was happening leading up to the moratorium, we'll be introducing Guillermo Tlacayautzin Suarez, who has been involved with the Chicano moratorium in LA and other struggles. El Señor Suarez is originally from Gilroy, California, and became active since his days in high school. He has continued to organize as a student and a machista while his time at San Jose State University and later as a law student at UC Berkeley, California. And soon after he became a community organizer locally in the Bay Area, nationally and internationally. He eventually joined Danza Cuauhtémoc in LA and other artist-based organizations he was proud to serve as a member of the National Chicano Moratorium Committee throughout his life. He has also spoken in solidarity for Puerto Rican struggles, the liberation of political prisoners, and for land occupation y los zapatistas. Welcome, Don Guillermo Tlacayotzin Suarez. Hello, Carlos. Having some difficulties here. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Don Guillermo. Okay, sorry. Bueno, vamos a iniciar ya. Este, mi nombre es Guillermo Tlacayautzin Suárez. Este, Tlacayautzin, este, Tlazocamati. To all of you that are tuning in, that are listening, that are, and hopefully you're going to stay with us the program, but more importantly, throughout the rest of your life, and you continue to struggle to liberate humanity from capitalism and imperialism. Este, yes, I was a member of the Chicano, the National Chicano Moratorium Committee in Los Angeles from 1990, when it was reconstituted, to approximately 2015, when I left uh, Los, the Los Angeles area, both for physical uh, reasons in questions of my health as well as questions of my work. Este, the Chicano Moratorium obviously takes place on August 29, 1970. Some people see it as a beginning, some people see it as an end, when in reality, it's a continuation. It is a continuation of the struggle of the indigenous people of these lands, and we go without recognizing the border, is to, to free ourselves from European colonialism. Uh, began in 1492, but in 1521, which we're coming up to 500 years, is when uh, Tenochtitlan fell, or they claim it fell, but we're still here. And so we are, we are a continuation of the indigenous struggle of resistance to this colonization, to this European. Now, August 29th didn't just develop by itself. It's not like it takes up from the sky. August 29th, the more than National Chicano Moratorium was a direct result of organization by Raza, by Chicanas, by Chicanos throughout what we call the occupied territories. We mean the land that was stolen from Mexico, it was stolen beginning in 1836, culminating in 1848 with the so-called Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The treaty, that last treaty was nothing more than a peace treaty, however, it's never been upheld. It's been violated since the very beginning. And so we think that we are still in a state of war with the United States. We are still at war. We are still resisting. 
In the 1960s, the late 1960s, prior to the National Chicano Moratorium Committee March, the Raza Chicanos, Chicanas, were active throughout the occupied territories. There's the Denver, to El Paso, to Albuquerque, to San Jose, to Los Angeles, to San Diego. Our communities, our people were standing up. We were standing up against injustice. We were standing up against discrimination. We were standing up about the fact that while we were at that time only approximately 10% of the population of the, of the so-called United States, we were coming back 20% of the body bags. So we were being disproportionately, uh, we were being disproportionately represented in the body bags. You know, we were being denied adequate health care. We were being denied education. Um, we were denied housing. You know, is to, we were victims of police brutality. We were victims of INS uh, deportations, INS repression. You know, now it may sound like I'm talking about 2020 because the conditions are still the same. You know, I mean, things have improved somewhat, but the, for the majority of our people, things have not changed. We are still struggling to protect our, our humanity, to protect our rights. Around the world in, 19, in the late 1960s, the people, the, the people of the world that were colonized, that were oppressed, were rising up against imperialism. And we need to see that the struggle for the Chicano Moratorium Committee was also a part of an anti-imperialist struggle to liberate the, our homelands. You know, in 1967, June 5th, Reyes Lopez Tejerina in Nuevo Mexico reignited the struggle to reclaim the lands of Nuevo Mexico. There were student walkouts in Los Angeles, in Oakland, here in San Jose, in Denver. There were walkouts throughout the occupied territories. I'm sorry, I keep seeing the chat, and so it's interrupting me. My, my train is out. And so we see that there were protests also against, the, against police brutality. There were demonstrations against ICE raids. All of this led up to the moratorium march in 1970. The, 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 the moratorium itself arose as a result of uh, the National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference that took place, although I'm getting echo now, that took place in Denver, Colorado in 1969. There, Rosalio Munoz, uh, Ben Alvarez, I got it, thank you, and um, Ernesto Vigil, all uh, famous draft dodgers burning the, their, their draft cards, refused the military service at that time. They issued a call for there to be a national demonstration against the war in Vietnam, because that's what the march was primarily about, to oppose U.S. intervention, U.S. imperialism in Vietnam. We also protested against the social conditions that, were, that, were, that our people were facing at that time. And so we see that the moratorium is but like a watershed. It is a continuation of our struggle. That we continue today to struggle against these same conditions. Today, we continue to struggle for the liberation of our homeland. Because if we do not control our homeland, we will not be able to control any of the issues that that face that our people face uh, at this time, you know. And so we have to see that the, the moratorium is a is a continuation, is a continuum of the resistance struggles of our people, and that we have to continue. Uh, I'm so, can you hear me still? I'm sorry, I'm getting a message that you cannot hear me. Hello. Thank you, Sitamina. And so we are part of the U.S., the part of the worldwide anti-imperialist struggles, the worldwide struggles for national liberation to create a new humanity, if you will, to create a new world order where, you know, I todo para todos, as the Zapatistas would say, we are not struggling for, you know, individual um, benefits and things. We are struggling for to better humanity, 
to better the social living conditions of all of humanity. And so we have to see that the moratorium wasn't just a one-shot deal. The moratorium, was, like I said, it's a watershed. Some people got stuck, left there. Other people expanded and saw that, yes, we have to continue the struggle. We have to struggle for socialism. We have to struggle for the liberation of our homeland. It's not enough to ask the government for police reforms or migra reforms. We have to do away with the migra. The, the migra is nothing more than an occupying army in our homeland. Gracias. So, don Guillermo. Yes. Y la lucha sigue, right? Our work is cut out for us, definitely. Gracias, Don Guillermo. We'd like to uh, share a clip from another film, Requiem 29, uh, before we introduce our next speaker. And we have so much knowledge in this space and the time is never enough. So we thank you for, you know, um, your patience as we compassionately move the program forward. Before we get to our next speaker, we'll be playing a clip and some footage from um, the cultura that was on display at the moratorium. Again, this began as a peaceful protest with a showcase of cultura, including Flor del Pueblo. Viva! 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 Viva la Revolución. Hablando de Cultura, today also marks two years of the painting over of the Mural de la Raza aquí en San Jose. And as much as we've fought for change, la lucha continúa, the fight continues. And to bring in some local perspective on topic for today's plática, we invite Arturo Villarreal to share what was going on in San Jose that led up to the Chicano Moratorium. Arturo Villarreal was born in San Jose with roots in Del Rio, Texas. He received his education at San Jose City College and later at San Jose State University, <clears throat> earning his master's degree in Chicano studies from San Jose State University as well. He wrote his thesis on Black Berets. He's an ethnic studies and anthropology professor at Evergreen Valley College here in San Jose, along with Nanette Ragua Villarreal is the co-author of the book, Mexicans in San Jose, and is also the author of Jose, Ma jo Ay, perdón, Jose Manuel Gonzalez, Apache Alcalde, Mayor of San Jose. Please help us welcome Profe Villarreal, respectfully. Thank you, Rosana. I appreciate that very much. <clears throat> and thank you all for inviting me. And it's nice to see all of you here. Um, <clears throat> 
Well, I'm not going to so much just touch on San Jose. It's just uh, the anti-Vietnam War in general. There'll be some San Jose in it, right? <clears throat> I am here from Ohlone territory, but uh, I was raised in Coahuilteco territory. Right across the border from Texas is Coahuila. Soy Coahuilteco. In any case, <clears throat> uh, during the time of the Chicano movement, uh, I was hanging out, uh, Chicano Moratorium as well, I was hanging out at Brown Beret headquarters in Del Rio, Texas, attending La Raza Unida rallies, uh, eventually trying to get Ramsey Munoz, Munoz, excuse me, uh, elected to governor, <clears throat> just for context. Okay, uh, next slide, please, or first slide. The anti-Vietnam War protest begins uh, around 1965, and many were very small in nature. <clears throat> the Students for Democratic Society organized many of the protests initially. Next slide. Next slide, please. Hello, next slide, please. Are we working on it? Next slide, please. Well, we're working on that, Profe. I think okay. It's nice to hear something because I, I was wondering if I was speaking to myself. Yeah, that's how it feels in these spaces, right? That's why yeah. I say our saving grace, but not always our best friend. Um, but we'll get through it. Let's get you on that next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's not the second one. You have to go back. Okay, okay. Uh, next one, please. So 67, a uh, major turning point, right? Because this, this is when you have the massive protest, San Francisco, New York, Washington, DC, uh, over 100,000 strong. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. King eventually comes around, right, to speaking up against the war, initially in 66, but in a big way in 67, uh, especially with the, the final, um, uh, lecture. Next one, please. June 4th, 1967, Muhammad Ali uh, refuses to be inducted into the draft. And you all remember his uh, famous quote, you know, no Viet Cong ever called me by the N word. <clears throat> uh, I think he was in prison for about five years behind this. Here's San Jose. San Jose wasn't uh, too far behind at all, right? November 2nd, 1967. There's the San Jose State University protest by the Students for Democratic Society and the professors against the war. They were protesting uh, against the Dow Chemicals, the producer of napalm. There was approximately 3,000 in attendance, largest protest at San Jose State up to that point. San Jose State University student Gil Villagran expelled along with a few other protesters. As we all know, uh, Villagran was eventually readmitted, uh, eventually becomes a professor of School of Social Work and never stopped being active. He got active because uh, he had lost a couple of friends. Next one, please. 1967, San Jose State student protests against the presence of ROTC on campus. Next slide, please. March 11, 1968, My Lai Massacre, 500 civilians murdered. Uh, this was big and, and this got everybody's attention, right? In a big way. Next one, next slide. <clears throat> the military, categorized Latinos racially as white and did not keep records of separate ethnic affiliation. The figures, that he, uh, the figures that as a result of the research conducted by the late political scientist, <clears throat> excuse me, Ralph Guzman, a doctoral student at UCLA in 1969, Dr. Guzman calculated the number of Spanish surnames from five Southwestern states <clears throat> with large concentrations of Mexican-American residents. <clears throat> 
based on casualty report from January 1961 to March 1969. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide. Oh, wait a minute, please. If we can go back. Thank you. His study, Mexican American Casualties in Vietnam, was released in 1970 and eventually published in 71. Next slide, please. <clears throat> According to Dr. Guzman's findings, Although Latinos made up only 11.9% of the total populations. And by the way, you know, these percentage points, they fluctuate, you know, one point this way or that way. They accounted for 19.4% of the casualties in Vietnam. I think it was another study out of CSU LA that uh, said it was, uh, they rounded it out. It said 10% of the population is what we were at the time and 20% casualties <clears throat> in Vietnam. His research also found that a substantial number of Latinos participated in high risk branches of the service with Latino casualties accounting for nearly a quarter of all Marine Corps casualties from the Southwest during the times he studied. This broad range of Latino veteran experience, he was talking about why some Latinos uh, enter the war, you know, to, you know, uh, maybe it's a family tradition, others, cause you know, the machismo factor, others because they were drafted and, then there's yet others like uh, Rosalio, right, Munoz, and and uh, <clears throat> and others who who refused. Um, this broad range, coupled with Guzman's research, galvanized the robust Latino anti-war efforts that culminated in one of the largest anti-war demonstrations during the Vietnam era, the Chicano Moratorium. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here we see uh, Rosalio Munoz, and uh, it was mentioned there was a couple of others. Uh, I forget the names. Uh, I know uh, Ernesto Vigil from the Crusade for Justice was one. There was a few others who refused draft. Next one, please. There you see him, Rosalio Munoz, uh, carrying the poster that was, uh, I believe, the flyer that was uh, distributed back then. Yeah, one of the principal organizers, along with a couple of others. And of course, this is what he read uh, there at the time, right? Uh, titled Chalik on the Draft, otherwise known as No to the Draft. Today, the 16th of September, the day of independence for all Mexican peoples, I declare my independence of the selective service system I accuse the government of the United States of America of genocide against the Mexican people. Specifically, I accuse the draft, the entire social, political, and economic system of the United States of America of creating a funnel which shoots Mexican youth into Vietnam to be killed and to kill innocent men, women, and children, and of drafting their laws so that many more Chicanos are sent to Vietnam in proportion to the total population than they send their own white youth so on, so on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this preceded the, the uh, <clears throat> Chicano moratorium. And, uh, you know, maybe it was like a premonition of, of, of something to come, right? Uh, of course, Chicano moratorium, there was also four killed, right? And along with, I think, 60 wounded, if not more than that. And this was a, that was an anti-Vietnam War uh, protest, by the way. And so getting back to uh, the Chicano Organization of Anti-War Protests, December 1969, there's an anti-war and an anti-draft protest for Chicanos and Latinos throughout the Southwest held at the Crusade for Justice headquarters. Of course, uh, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez uh, was there, <clears throat> the leader of the Crusade. December 20th, 1969, you had the very first Chicano Moratorium in East LA, over 1,000 in attendance. February 28th, 1970, the second Chicano Moratorium in East LA, 3,000 in attendance. And of course, uh, the major one, the big one, right? August 29th, 1970, 30,000. There were also local moratoriums uh, planned for cities throughout the Southwest and beyond. Most had over 1,000. Is there another slide? That's it for me. Um, hopefully that, that gives a little context in, uh, in terms of what was 
in the protest movements uh, leading up to the Chicano moratorium. Definitely. Gracias, Profe. And to our comunidad, please share some snaps, some reactions, some chat comments um, in the chat uh, and, and respond to each other. It's a conversation, right, as best as we can in this virtual space. Moving on in the program, we want to uplift and amplify that LA is also organizing, as we speak, a national action to commemorate the 50 years as well. And to stay on top of that information, make sure you're following the Mai San Jose page for updates and how to engage with that effort. Uh, there is a caravan going down there during these pandemic times. It's a, it's a tricky thing to navigate, but we are resourceful and creative and we do not lack an imagination. It is a part of our Floricanto legacy. And so I encourage you to please make sure you're following the page so that you can uh, become a part of the action as well. And now that we've received a solid overview of the Chicano Moratorium, we'd like to share some testimonios from people who were there that day. We're honored to welcome veteranos from San Jose, Helen Najera Reyes, Ben Cadena, and Ed Robledo. These three were at the Chicano Moratorium. They were actually on stage performing in the clip you saw earlier. And if we've got Helen in the room here, I would like to invite Helen uh, to unmute herself and share with us. She is the author of From New Mexico to California, Grandpa Lee and His Stories, to be published in the fall of 2020. I'm looking forward to it so much. Helen is a singer and songwriter with two CDs, Elena and Ballad of Grandpa Lee. She's been married 49 years and is a proud mother of four talented daughters and a grandmother of seven. Helen, bienvenida. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to start by um, continuing my uh, bio where I was at San Jose State. I um, joined Mecha on a march to Sacramento protesting the cuts in education. And I joined uh, picket lines for boycott, boycotting grapes and other uh, boycotts. I performed with Teatro de la Gente throughout my years at San Jose State. I became a reading specialist and served at a school with over 80% Mexican immigrant families and it was a great experience. And this is um, my LA moratorium story. I went to the LA uh, moratorium because I am an anti-war protester and I was protesting the disproportionate number of Latinos fighting in Vietnam. On a more personal note, I was protesting what happened to my brother and others like him. My brother was a 17 year old Marine who witnessed the ravages of the Vietnam War. He contracted malaria and he was given drugs and became very ill. When I saw him at the Naval Hospital in Oakland, he was like a vegetable. He never quite recovered and he died when he was only 40 years old. My experience at the LA Moratorium started out promising. It was a beautiful day. People were sitting on the grass peacefully, listening to speeches and the music of Flor del Pueblo of which I have sung with, suddenly uh, we heard a loud commotion in the far, far distance uh, from the crowd. And we didn't know what was happening, but the crowd started running in our direction. We got up to, ran to run also. And um, we knew we were running for our lives when we saw a police patrol car jump the curb and drive across someone's lawn trying to run people over. I'm, I support the police, but there are some that are not you know, decent people. I also saw SDS students with um, gas masks on and it was, it was just chaos with people setting fires in the middle of the street, people screaming and running everywhere. We didn't know which way to turn when suddenly a white van pulled up, the doors were open and the occupants told us to get in. Once inside the van, I realized that the driver was none other than playwright and director Luis Valdez and his eight month old pregnant wife Lupe Valdez was in the passenger seat. They dropped us off on Whittier Boulevard in a safe area and thank God for them. I truly believe they saved us. It was a really um, tra traumatic experience for myself and a, a lot of people that were there. And uh, that's my story. Gracias, Senora Helen, 
for your beautiful Floricanto generally and for your testimonio in this space about what was happening on the ground. And you know what we got today is a part of the story and a compelling part indeed. So thank you for continuing to speak on that and to continue to fill the, wor the world with, uh, with your story and these other ways that speak to not just our minds, but our hearts and our spirit. You're Moving welcome. on, thank you. Moving on in the program, uh, allow me to introduce to two musicians and so much more. Uh, we have Ben Cadena, born in San Jose, California. Music has always been part of his life. He recalls playing clarinet in elementary school at Anne Darling and baritone sax at Roosevelt Middle School. He saw a performance at Teatro Urbano, San Jose's first Chicano theater, and was hooked. Given his skills, he was quickly involved in music for the act though he did a fair amount of acting. Through Teatro Urbano, he found himself involved with Teatro Campesino, the UFW, and other community struggles. He is proud of his Chumash roots and his long history of supporting Chicano rights through both music and teatro. We also have Eduardo Robledo, musician, actor, and educator. Started his career in 1969 with Teatro Campesino and continues his relationship with that company to this day. In 1975, Mr. Robledo joined the San Francisco Mime Troupe and was a member of that collective until 1987. He had the honor of accepting the 1987 Tony Award for Outstanding Regional Theater for the company. Mr. Robledo is a founding member of the musical group, Flor del Pueblo. He has composed and recorded on five albums. Mr. Robledo is currently working on soundtrack album for Quixote Nuevo, a play by Octavio Solis. Thank you both for being here and for sharing some musica with the audience. And I will mute myself and let you all take it away. Pero para escucharlos, you all have to, you have to unmute yourself so I can mute myself, if we make sense. Yo soy chicano, tengo un color, americano, pero con honor. Cuando me dicen que hay revolución, defiendo a mi raza con mucho valor. Tengo todita mi gente para la revolución. Voy a luchar con los pobres para que se acabe el bolón. Yo soy chicano, tengo color, americano, pero con honor. Cuando me dicen que hay revolución, defiendo a mi raza con mucho valor. Tengo mi orgullo, tengo mi fe, soy diferente, soy color café, tengo cultura, tengo corazón y no me lo quita a mí ningún cabrón. Ajua. Ajua, so gracias. To share a little bit about memories of that day. Uh, why did you go? And what was it like to be there as músicos de la, del movimiento? Great. Real quick, I'm going to introduce my compadre, mm -hmm. Charlie, who uh, has only been playing with us for about 20 years. <laughs> so, so I, I wasn't there. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was a child. But Ben and I have been playing together over 50 years. We started uh, 10 years before we were born. <laughs> and uh, so taking us to the Chicano Moratorium, we were both part of uh, Teatro Urbano. Oh, yeah. Before that, we started another group, Teatro de la Gente, and uh, needed to be part of the anti-war movement, the Chicano anti-war movement. So we drove down in Ben's car and uh, with my sister and cousin, two cousins, and uh, met up with another group, Teatro Aslan, and uh, got up on stage and played music for the rally. And it was a beautiful day, as Helen said. 
and it was a wonderful experience and exciting and vibrant and then chaos hit I'll help broke loose. you want to go ben yeah i'll help broke loose we, we just got hit i think i remember being more concerned about the girls and just getting the hell out of there we got tear gassed the cops just came in and beat us it was a cop ride it wasn't a street down there yeah and uh a friend of mine a friend of ours uh joel vinegra was part of the black berets in san jose and he says we're making a human chain to divide the people and the cops. So I gave my compadre Andy my guitar, ran out to the front, and Joel and I locked arms, and then bottles started flying from the people to the cops. And I said, Joel, I'm not holding this line. He goes, me either. So we took off, but it was crazy. It was chaos. Yep. And uh a beautiful day for a great cause. We were all uh, in danger of being drafted. We were all, most of us mm -hmm. drafted. There was a huge movement against the war. We couldn't make sense of why the United States was fighting or why we were getting drafted. Uh, I did get drafted. I got my uh, conscientious objector status and uh, worked along with all my compadres, all my friends, to stop the war in Vietnam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. What a great performance and uh, some, some words that are very relatable to folks showing out and showing out into the streets today and, and taking to the streets, trying to march peacefully Thank you, guys. And, and, you know. That's it. Yep. Thank you. Y qué bonita sorpresa as we also extend that welcome to Charlie Montoya, who we saw on the accordion. Charlie is a social worker by day and a musician 24 hours. He contributes to his musicianship and cultura cura vision here in San Jose regionally and around the nation. You will see him performing with a few other bandas también from conjunto to son to rock to Chicano groove. And I can't wait to scope out some more performances past this point. And I think, again, many folks watching now from that younger generation can connect to this story as much as we may not have been there, that dynamic still exists in the streets of that chaos that we're met with when we do try to gather peacefully. And so these stories are important to pass on and to hear about and to connect to that this indeed is a part of our history and our present reality. So thank you again. And if we could have some appreciations from the celebration uh, in the chat with the little claps on the Zoom and all the dorky tools we have at our disposal for that energia um, and for us to really build community together. And I think we're rolling with the, with the flow here. If there's anything I've learned in my 11 years as a danzante, it's that we need to know how to flow and that as much as we can go over the pasos and do the thing, sometimes we just got to flow. And so you'll see me flowing with the uh, with the program sequence a little bit different than we had planned to accommodate folks and our technology and it looks like we're going to try to uh invite la senora shirley trevino shirley are you in the in the yes. zoom room beautiful I am. okay then let me introduce you properly we have another veterana mm -hmm. shirley trevino who is not far from me. I'm currently talking to all of you from Gilroy, and I think you're out in the San Juan Bautista area right now, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah, and so originally, Shirley was in LA fighting issues of police brutality, educational disparities, and women's rights through work on community projects, and also with various organizations locally here in San Jose for a long time. Um, she was a member of the Community Alert Patrol, patrolling the east side on Friday and Saturday nights, serving to deter police brutality and or to document it. In 1971, she became part of the Hellyer Park Eight, who were arrested while documenting police brutality. She was the youngest person elected to be president of the Confederación de la Raza Unida. She was one of the organizers of La Raza Unida Party, who the Mercury News described as an awakening giant. She has worked in the field of labor relations for over 40 years, earning a reputation as a strong advocate for workers, 
Her volunteer work stems from a deep commitment to social justice and a grassroots approach to organizing. Presently, she is a member of the Farm Worker Task Force. She's helping farm workers with services during this pandemic, very necessary for the times. Thank you, Maestra Shirley. We are honored to have you and I will let you take the virtual floor here. Gracias. I was um, a student at Santa Clara University when we heard about the moratorium and um, I had uh, prior to uh, going, I had actually been at, found a friend of mine from East LA who lived right off of Whittier. And I had gone to spend the 69th summer with him to work. And so um, I decided that I would leave the night before uh, the, uh, the 29th. So I left on the 28th uh, to spend some time with her. So in the morning of the 29th, uh, we went to Belvedere Park. We had been working on some uh, police issues in San Jose. So when I got to Belvedere Park, I saw a police station and it worried me. But then I saw all the 20,000 people surrounded me and I felt safe. But that safety was not to continue throughout the day. And the Vietnam War was affected me because when I was starting to graduate, in the June of 1966, a very dear friend of mine from Bakersfield, Ernie Dominguez died in Vietnam in June. So that was a, a real inspiration for me to be more part of the Chicano Moratorium. So I ended up at Belvedere Park and we started the march, which was about maybe four miles. We uh, walked down, ended up on Atlantic Boulevard and then uh, started on Whittier Boulevard. And my friend actually lived off of Ford in Whittier. So um, I felt, well, th this is great. I'm surrounded by 20,000 people that are gonna keep me safe. Her house is not far from, this, uh, from the march and you know I can always uh, uh, go to her, her house for whatever. So anyway, we continued the march and ended up at, the, at uh, Laguna Park. And I would say I was about uh, three quarters of the way behind the stage. Uh, and it was good because I saw Ben Cadena on the stage. And I, when I first moved to San Jose, we were part of a, 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 an organization. And again, that brought uh, more feeling of safety for me. Then um, the music was going on and the dancers, we were enjoying ourselves, everything was peaceful. And then I, I felt this like this, uh, the, sh the, the, the earth shaking. And uh, next thing you know, like Ed Robledo said, you saw the tear gas and the bottles being thrown. And I said, do I run or do I help people that are falling? And I said, no, I'm gonna stay and help people that are falling because I'm now in my seventies and there were mothers there, I would say that were there in their you know, 50s, 60s and 70s as well. And so I saw elderly women falling. I saw children falling. I saw people scrambling and there was a fence. There was a fence that I, I noticed that uh, I said, how do we get beyond that fence? And so. I helped as much as I could to pick people up. And then I decided that I should run because uh, uh, the batons, I could see the cops coming with the batons and uh, I, I took off running and I was trying to find my friends and I couldn't find them, we lost each other. But behind uh, the, the park, there were these small little homes and um, they, they, you know, and I was dodging bottles and trying to, you know, dodge the, the smoke in the air, and there were these homes on the side of the road, on the on, on the other side of the park, and they were taking people in, and it was uh, uh, amazing because they were opening their doors, and um, I went uh, first. I went behind a bush, and then um, you know I, I uh, stood there for a while, and then I said, "Oh my God, I I better go into uh, one of these homes." Uh, who my husband Ralph, who was there as well. Uh, they opened up a church, he said, and he went in. And so we were protected by that community to be safe. And um, what I wanna say about that moratorium is that it's not only about 
our Chicano history. It's part of American history. And I'm so glad that those the organizers of this Platica today are sharing this history with other people who didn't know about it. I saw a, uh, an interview of people on Whittier Boulevard over the, the last year and there, nobody that the gentleman interviewed knew about the Chicano Moratorium. And so I'm really grateful that we're able to share our stories and we're able to share this history. And thank you to the group that created the Platica so that we could be part of that and sharing that with the, the, the greater community. Thank you. Thank you, Maestra Shirley, and for being here and, and always sharing and being willing to share that history and that trauma. And, you know, as much as I wasn't there, I could I could feel that sense of panic coming through your, your testimonio. So I, I just want to share some of the signs that I read while I was marching. I have my own sign. Abrazos, no balazos. My fight is in the barrio and not in Vietnam. And nuestra lucha está aquí, no allá. Thank you. Powerful, powerful. Gracias, Maestra Shirley. Gracias. Before we introduce our next speaker, we wanted to share a clip of a protest march um, that took place here in San Jose a week after the moratorium. We'll share the following clip and then introduce our speaker, um, Adrian, who will explain what you see going on on the screen and here in, in Don Adrian Tepewa Vargas, if you could be ready uh, after the clip, we'd appreciate it. Gracias. And try to get the respect from the established community. What about East Palo, East Palo Alto, East San Jose? Uh, do you feel that you're denied rights in your hometown? Definitely, definitely. We had uh, about a month ago, uh, as you may know, we had uh, Garcia, uh, who was assassinated by the police department. San Jose Police Department. Also, we had other, uh, such as Manuel Villa, uh, myself, who was arrested for charges uh, that uh, I still believe, and that many other people who seen the situation believe I was not guilty. Uh, the jurisdictional system must change in, in San Jose for the Spanish-speaking people, La Raza, Chicano, Mexican-American, uh, Mexicanos, however we identify ourselves. Uh, the housing is poor. Uh, we have um, uh, absentee uh, landlords, uh, facilities are poor. Uh, for example, right around the corner here, we have the East Side Recreation Center, uh, which we had to fight to keep our own people, people of our own level, uh, uh, that could relate with the teenagers, that could relate with the people. Uh, uh, the, the East Side has a double of the police department. Uh, uh, the Can housing the number yes in the precincts it's uh, it's a larger uh, I think it's 32 precincts and uh, there's uh, enough harassment which is hard to prove because every time we come up with the cameras or etc etc such as we did last night we were going by and we were accused of certain things that we did not do and uh, these are the type of, uh, the type of things that are happening uh, uh, housing employment uh, which we call the economic discrimination of the Spanish speaking or el mexicano americano chicano uh, 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 there's many problems in the east side in the west side uh, Dalmas in that barrio uh, also we have problems uh, by the police department and uh, employment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see, we're still fighting against police brutality now more than ever. We need to be engaged, informed, and united in black and brown solidarity against state violence locally and abroad. Pero como dice el profe Villarreal, la lucha está aquí y ha estado aquí por buen tiempo. So now that we, you know, have access to these stories in a different way than we have in the past, it's important to share that with all of the generations, not just reaching back, but moving forward. And we're still fighting for basic human rights. As we can see, as much as we did then, we are continuing the fight now. And, and now it is an honor to introduce you to our next speaker, Adrián Tepewa Vargas, who will share his testimonio and then uh, offer a performance. Adrián Tepeo Vargas, aguánteme un poquito. Aguánteme un poquito. Uh, ¿Me acerco? 
No, aguánteme unos 30 segundos, no, nada más para no, avisarle okay. a la gente quién está viendo, porque no todos saben todavía, pero deben de saber. So, Adrián Tepewa Vargas has been producing artist, educator, and, and cultural work uh, for over 50 years. His work has been expressly tied to social issues in the community. He has been the director of San Jose's seminal professional Chicano theater group, Teatro de la Gente, as well as Centro Cultural de la Gente in the 70s. He is the co-founder of the Mexican Heritage Plaza and founder of the annual community-wide Dia de los Muertos Ceremonia and Festival 22 years in the making. In 2004, he received the California Arts Council Director's Award for lifetime contributions to the state of California and the arts. Currently, he is a full-time caregiver and his Casa Vargas Productions creative industry effort is a partner with the Centro Aslan Chico Mostac in collaborative social action campaigns and directing arts and cultural programs there. And as you can see, Adrian is ready to roll at all times with his sleeves ready to, to play some music. If we could have folks um, after Adrian, Don Adrian plays some, some music for us, he is going to offer some testimonio. I invite you as an audience to go ahead and throw your questions into the chat in the interest of time so that we can make sure that the conversation continues. Y ahora sí, Don Adrian Tepewa Vargas, take it away. Let's unmute you. Un narrar un poquito es uh, 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 the uh, uh, the response that was made in San Jose to the uh, the, the police riot in uh, in uh, Los Angeles um, that uh, organized a 1,000 plus number of people march on the police department, mind you, directly at the police station, because uh, we felt that that kind of response by any police department was uh, brutal, and it should not interfere with our uh, demonstrations, which we had been having here already. It was a, a intended warning to the police department that we had community alert patrol, we can document things, and they can't get away with things uh, on our people. Um, it, 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 we have to realize that that was capable of organizing in one short week, because prior to that one year in 1969, we had a police riot right here in San Jose with the Fiesta de las Rosas. So the result of that riot actually served to organize La Confederación de la Raza Unida, a, a coalition of over 25 groups that, like this, were able to mobilize their people, all our people, into a march that uh, numbered over 1,000 that went directly to the police station to make our statement, very important statement, that they cannot do this kind of stuff indiscriminately against our people because we will challenge them. Um, we have uh, our, our armas de la no violencia and we have our armas de otra parte. And uh, the Blackberries were very instrumental in organizing this march. Chemo, who you saw on the screen, was telling, like, telling it like it was. We have a lot of conditions here in San Jose. And part of it is that the police is, is, is controlling our environment, our behavior, because we're basically left out. And we have a possibility of getting angry over that. So uh, that was the main message of that massive march. And we organized it in a way so that uh, uh, there was elders, adults, children, we protected them. And because it happened in such a short time, we could only march on the sidewalk. And we had to limit it to two people in line, uh, next, uh, you know, marching, a two-person march. So it extended. It was una uh, serpiente de Quetzalcoat, and um, and made a statement. We were all being watched by the police. We were all being photographed. We were all being uh, under surveillance. But it was a peaceful march 
and the police did not go out of control in their own home base. So um, uh, it goes to show you that uh, when you're organized and you have the capability to organize, you can do anything. And that, in my opinion, is part of what's missing today. Uh, uh, strong organizational perspectives that uh, can mobilize quickly and um, make the, the issue well known and um, the fact that you're not gonna back down, like, like uh, uh, Maestro Guillermo said, stand up for it, stand up for your rights. And um, don't let what they did happen in LA, happen in San Jose. We all had a uh, police riot in 1969, and we learned from that. We formed our confederation, Confederación de la Raza Unida. That's who organized this march. And, um, um, you know, the musicians were out in front. Uh, we had uh, uh, black parades who were running security. And we told all the people what to do in case the police reacted. So we, were, we had a plan, we were organized, and uh, uh, it was effective. Uh, it, 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 it is a, an important statement for not only how we supported our brothers and sisters in LA, but also how we prevent uh, police actions to come down against us. And um, it, it, to the effect that the following uh, uh, Chicano Auditorium in 1971, uh, we were invited. CAP, Community Alert Patrol, was invited. I attended, Jaime Gallardo spoke for CAP, and he was the chairman of CAP. And he was looking up at the helicopters all over, and he says, LA needs a Community Alert Patrol. LA needs a Community Alert Patrol. And everybody agreed. But guess what? Some commotion started happening again in another little corner, and we left before it turned into anything else. The wounds are there in LA. Uh, the wounds are there with anybody uh, that had read any of the articles that Ruben Salazar had written. So um, it, it, it is uh, also important to know that at that time we had a very important consciousness of internationalism, uh, being supportive of uh, allied uh, uh, countries that were revolutionary like Cuba, uh, what was emerging in Nicaragua and in El Salvador. So, uh, uh, if, con uh, permiso, the song that I would like to do for you all is um, a canción that um, is called Che, for short. Should I start? Échale. Adelante. Bueno. Comandante Che Guevara Aprendimos a quererte Desde la histórica altura Donde de tu bravura Que tú no sé cuál la muerte Aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Aprendimos a quererte desde la 
histórica altura, donde el sol de tu bravura te hace no ser cual la muerte, y aquí se queda la clara, la extraña transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante que llevará. Como junto a ti seguimos y con el pueblo te decimos hasta siempre, comandante. Aquí se queda la clara, la extraña de transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Que viva Che, 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 que viva Che, Che, Che. Que viva che, 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 que viva che, 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 que viva che, 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 que viva che. Chazo Camachi. Gracias, don Adrián Tepewa Vargas. That canción had that effect of I can't even find my words right now and I have a script to roll with here next to me. But um, we are transitioning into the question and answer segment. I have a few questions that the audience and comunidad has posted here, um, starting with the red signs that they were holding up. Uh, what did they say? And that's a question from Jose Villarreal. Don Adrian, is that a question you can answer? The, the red signs that people were holding up on the during the video in the march. Thank you, Carlos. Well, it looks like we'll we'll throw these questions in here and um, you know, this is not the, the final pieces of the conversation. It's a glimpse into the ongoing conversation. Um, and folks have also asked, how do we stay in touch for future action in San Jose? We'll address that in, in just a little bit in the program here in closing remarks. Um, there is another question here in the chat related to the platica. Um, and it reads, I was told that the San Jose protest in 1970 did a sit-in at the San Jose police station. If this is true, can we hear more about this? Who is that question for? That question, we can start with you and... Um... Well, yeah, it was definitely at the police station. We, we, we targeted the police station um, because uh, we, 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 we wanted to, first of all, acknowledge what had happened in LA and tell the local police department that we will never accept in no way that kind of that surreptitious sort of action in San Jose against our demonstrations because we were demonstrating a lot at that time. San Jose was a very active movimiento center throughout Aslan. We had the first walkout uh, uh, in the colleges. We had the first walkout in the junior highs before the 68 walkout in LA. Um, we had a police riot at the Fiesta de las Rosas, and that caused us to organize ourselves. And um, uh, it, was a, it was a tremendous uh, strategy to confront our local police after uh, the August 29th police riot, because it made its point to the local police. You know, uh, we were dealing with kicking out judges. We were dealing with, I mean, we, we were, you know, joke, joke interviews for 
what does it take to a Chicano to become a sheriff? And oh, just a, a lot of bad news that was going on in San Jose because it was a racist town. <laughs> it, it was totally racist. And, um, uh, but, you know, when you have something like what happens in LA, 20,000 people, um, well, and, 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 and it all breaks out, uh, that's a big documentation. And we wanted to make sure that in a uh, uh, homely little town in San Jose, where we have activists and we have issues, they cannot come out to us with the same ploy as LA cops went out to LA. And we made our point. One of the one of the things that we did was um, I would talk about the community, uh, the police coming out to the community to meet us, to meet the, uh, the people, so that there would be less confrontation if you knew your neighbor. And uh, when the police got wind of the fact that uh, as Chicanos and Camino Le Patrol, you know, was was active, they put out what was known as the Chicano Sheriff's Test, and um, it was so racist that the I was a uh, president of the Confederacion at the time, we did a press release about how racist it was. It said things like, who's the governor of California, Ricardo Montalban, you know, things like that. And, and why do low riders use those little berries uh, on their cars um, when you arrest them? And so um, uh, we got sued for slander uh, and defamation of character when we came out against that test and said, um, you know, how low they could go uh, against our community, and um, then they countersued us. But uh, yeah, things were not, uh, they were killing Chicanos here in San, in San Jose. Yeah. Uh, you know, Trevino and, and others that, uh, you know, uh, IBM executive uh, was killed, and, and uh, you know, we organized time and time again protests against the police department. Uh, we asked for a community uh, review board, which they would not give us. Uh, and uh, was, we were trying to focus it similar to the Berkeley Police Review Board, uh, but uh, we didn't get that. And, uh, you know, the fight and the struggle continued. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I saw Shirley, there's a question here that maybe you or if Helen is still um, in, the, in the room can, can answer. We had someone ask, um, we're listening to Helen and Shirley, women very much involved in the movement. Were you, were you and other women recognized as leaders um, during that time and also moving forward? Uh, I, I, I was, uh, I belonged to a group that eventually uh, had to organize itself. It was called the uh, Mujeres de Aslan. And we used to call what they, at that time, were the Jose's that were in control of everything. Jose Lopez, the Jose, Jose, Jose. And um, they wouldn't give us a seat at the table. And so we created Mujeres de Aslan. Later on, uh, as we organized and began to push ourselves to have a seat at the table, um, I heard that, you know, that I viene las mujeres de Aslan, you know, like. And um, at the beginning, it was very difficult, even though uh, Ernestina Garcia uh, became one of the, the, the women uh, head of the Confederacion, the first woman of the Confederacion de las Unidas. I became the second uh, woman. Uh, we still had those, um, those uh, divisions to deal with, you know. Uh, when I applied to law school at San Francisco State, I got denied uh, a seat because of a Chicano. Mm -hmm. said that I could Chicana and would create division between all of them if I uh, joined uh, uh, the student uh, law school student body there and uh, was totally opposite. What I was always trying to do is to unify people. I, um, this is Helen. Can you hear me? Yes. I couldn't um, hear part of your question, but um, from what Shirley said, I think when I was at San Jose State, um, everything was kind of run by, you know, the guys. So Leila Chavez and Gloria Chupi Hernandez and I went to the ASB and got funding and we put on 
the very first uh, Chicano Latino um, cultural event at San Jose State. We called it Nuestra Noche and it was all women run and uh, all women were performing except for one Aztec dance we did. We, we invited some men to be partners there, but it was the first thing that the women organized and got the funding for and controlled at San Jose State. So I'm really proud of that. I just want to say one other thing, and this has not been a, a part of the discussion uh, since CAP started, but uh, we had a very strong uh, Chicana in CAP. Uh, she was known as Fran Escalante. She was one of the first Chicana uh, student body president at City College. And so Fran and I and uh, several of the Chicanas in CAP talked about uh, maybe we could uh, have uh, a Fran be the head of CAP. We were told, I won't say by who, but that the Latino Chicano community was not ready for a Chicana to lead CAP. And um, we didn't, she didn't, she never became a head of the CAP because of that whole, you That's know, not Chicano right. thinking that we're not ready for it. But wow. we were more ready for it than they were. Because <laughs> <laughs> at, at Hellier Park, it was, uh, of the eight of us, seven of us were Chicano. Wow. I Can think I say something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. This is Tony Quintero. And uh, I remember uh, Shirley and Helen back from those days and how they were real women leaders. And I, I really hope that we uh, have learned a lot from this because, uh, of course, women have come a long way and we still have a ways to go. And uh, um, I, I, but I do want to say, yeah, I was there and uh, witnessed uh, what I've heard too, the uh, women and children being <coughs> picked up and dragged and uh, just a very scary scene. I was there because I was the, uh, I was on the board of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And I was the president of La Raza National Law Students Association. And we were there to try and get uh, the law schools to open up uh, more positions for Latinos and quit sending us to Vietnam. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think the most important thing we learned from it was that uh, we witnessed a peaceful demonstration of over 20,000 people. Some said there were probably 30,000, but it, it, was, it was suddenly destroyed. And uh, I remember speaking, I remember it was an amazing audience. It was never before so many people and it was just so exciting to see such a beautiful demonstration. And that suddenly, I didn't know what happened, but I, all of a sudden I was on the ground and people were falling and everybody was running and screaming in all directions. And uh, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong, but I'll tell you, I was running as fast as everyone else just to avoid getting beat up. Everybody knew the police were coming and the police did intentionally create a riot. <laughs> The people that were there were peaceful and continued to be uh, throughout, except for the police brutality. And I had some law student friends that actually had, uh, we took a contingent of law students there to demonstrate. And uh, some of them had bullets actually fly whiz right by their heads. Um, I, was, I was staying at a friend's house, Miguel de la Pena, who was a law student, the first year law student at Berkeley that year. And we were staying at his house and uh, uh, on the, trying to find it. I, I never realized how, how I didn't understand the LA, East LA streets at all and Brooklyn Avenue and all, I mean, all these streets, Whittier. And I'm running and it was night by that time and I just kept running and all I could hear is cops coming in one direction, people screaming, so I'd run the other way. And I got pulled into a, to a, some community center and a bunch, everybody was hiding inside and hoping that they didn't shoot into the place. It was a, a very chaotic scene. And um, I finally got out of there and was trying to get it back to uh, this guy's house I was staying at. And there were people pulling people in to get them off the street into their houses. And I managed to finally uh, find the place and they pulled me in and uh, it was a real, real crazy scene. But yeah, that's, that's what I remember. And yeah, I'm really glad and appreciate what you've done to, to memorialize this and to keep this, uh, this information available to our community. Gracias, and uh, thank you for providing that testimony. Um, it, we do have a couple more questions and comments here. Uh, do continue to throw them into the chat, and if we don't get to them here, also know that KKUP is running um, it, programming all day about the moratorium, um, and you can continue to hear stories, 
música, flor y canto, la cultura de nuestra lucha um, on the radio, on the airwaves, KKUP. We have Dr. Ramon Martinez, um, founding member of La Raza Historical Society and just local historian who goes around with his camera getting everyone else's stories. And so anytime he has a chance to share his, we also want to listen. Yeah, Ramon. Um, so thank you for, for having that space. Um, to KKUP and to the elders who are offering their testimonio in multiple spaces so that we can have access to this history. Someone did point out in the chat that there was also a riot at Overfelt High School in, in October of 1968 and that the school was closed down for 2.5 days, also Chicano led. Um, and I'm going to bring us back to the questions that were asked here as well. There's so much that, that we just don't know by our local history. And so events like these are necessary and we're thankful that you all are taking time to share and listen. Um, one of the questions that was also posed in the chat is, uh, do you think the power of music contributed to the movement and is that the same today? And that's a general question to the speakers. I'd like to respond to that. Uh, the, the Chicano music uh, that was part of the movimiento is eternal because it was part of a historical time frame. Y eso se vale dentro de ese time frame. If it carries forward into another time frame because of the content, the message that it has, then that's good. However, there is always modernity. There is always an effort to um, do something new. There's always <clears throat> art progressing to be uh, better art or different art or a variety of art. That's not bad. But what musicians like me that when the Movimiento are concerned about is that you're not in the modernity in the progress of the style of music that you're creating now are you giving a good message? Are you giving a message of unity? Are you giving a message of power? Because, um, well, I don't see it. And uh, it's not being created. So uh, that's why these corridos, which can be turned into modern corridos, um, are important for the future. Um, we should not be limited to the imagination that we are born with. And other youth are born with their own imaginations. But if they can learn from the others, if they can learn styles, which some do, uh, and get the content, and get specifically the historical context, the social context of why that is, then they can be inspired to write something new about that, that which happened in history, or write about something that is happening today. I have a major concern why, uh, for example, uh, what we're doing today, uh, there's a disconnect with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, uh, we're not talking about that at all, and yet there's uh, tremendous momentum in that. So um, ideally, I, I, could, I could see a young Chicano, a young Chicana, writing music about the black and brown unity that needs to take place. Um, uh, it, it has to. You know, um, there's a momentum going uh, for that movement. And we have our own momentum for uh, recognizing our historical periods. But somehow, some way, it has to blend, it has to connect. We all have to be giving the same message in the present. Besides just speeches, besides just rhetoric, but in the music. I wanna say that uh, Black Lives Matter to us in, in, this, in, uh, in the 70s. Angela, I don't know if you know this, but Angela Davis's trial was switched to San Jose uh, because she couldn't have a fair trial 
And because there weren't too many African-Americans in, uh, in San Jose at the time, it was Chicanos that helped free Angela Davis. It was our marching, our protest, our rallies on her behalf that helped her to be free. And that there were, you know, she was, uh, was decided that she wasn't guilty of the crime yeah. charged against her. Um, we organized Chicano. There were rallies that came out in support of her. And uh, when she wrote her book, in her book, she talked about cat community members helping her in her trial. And so we have been part of that black movement and yes. uh, it, for uh, uh, many, many years here in San Jose. And I also and want she, to say she, that- not and a, Angela Davis it. acknowledges that because CAP helped to establish the, um, uh, say that about that, Shuri, please. How, how CAP narrowed down the, um, the jury. Yeah, well, we, was, uh, we did the jurying of the jury. And we, we had, we, I was assigned to go to a juror and knock on the door and try to find out everything about that juror in order to see if that would be a good juror for Angela. I, I pretended my car had broken down and I knocked at the door and I asked them if I could use their phone. And I started scoping out of their house. What kind of magazines do they have on the table? What kind of art would they have? You know, what did their house look like? And then I came back and reported uh, uh, to this. So we vordeered the jury for Angela community liberal patrol members. But I also want to say that not only did music have an impact on, on the movement, but uh, the written word, poetry and art. And at that time, I was writing a lot of poetry. And, um, but I was, I was not invited, uh, like most of the men were invited to participate in the, you know, the poetry uh, events and the poetry uh, gatherings, except for Tino Esparza. One day he said, surely, we need to have a woman on the stage too. And he invited me to read uh, my poetry at the uh, 1993 uh, Fairmont Motel where uh, the Kuzma House and, and uh, Knox had uh, a conference. Uh, but you know, like, when you ask about the women involved, we were, we were there, uh, the men were on most of those committees. They didn't ask us to participate, except there was one man Tino Esparza, who said, you come and read your poetry, Shirley. Yeah. So uh, we still, I think, have to uh, fight some of those battles. Viva Tino. Definitely. Thank you, Shirley, for that perspective. It's one that many Chicanas today continue to experience um, on a similar parallel level. And so uh, as much as, uh, you know, it, it pulls on our heartstrings that this is a, a struggle long in coming. It's, it's also part of a bigger dysfunctional dynamic. So we thank you so much for holding your space here and throughout history. Um, we do have a final question that I'm gonna, two technically, that I'm gonna condense into one. Um, in part, the younger generation here would like to hear about some stories about housing or land struggles in San Jose, I think that can be its own platica and see. So the committee here has some homework to do. And um, that's a whole topic in and of itself. But the last question I'm gonna pose to the speakers and elders here is this. What do you hope to see moving forward in the San Jose Chicano, Chicana community, Chicanx community? What are some lessons learned to pass onward? That's a big question. Well, you know, well, that, that's a big question because we have a big pandemic right now. <laughs> you know, so um, we're limited in what we can do uh, as long as this uh, reality exists. However, uh, we have campaigns to educate our community on how to protect themselves. I mean, this is how, to the extent that the movimiento goes through. Because when we see, uh, governmental institutions uh, misreporting the, the information, not uh, going out with popular in, popular styles of information to educate our gente on how they can protect our, themselves. Uh, we're the most infected, we're the biggest ones in the hospitals, we're the most that are dying. So some of us have taken that cause and that's where we're giving our effort because 
how can you create a better society uh, um, demand for better education in school? So it looks like we might have lost Don Adrian's feed somehow and we'll see if he comes back. But if he doesn't, I did want to acknowledge some insights happening in this in this uh, chat and a lot of folks, you know, this starts to trigger all of the 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 rich history uh, that's kind of been buried in our bigger Chicano history telling. And if that San Jose had the first militant organization, Cesar Chavez began organizing here. We had the first walkouts. Lowrider Magazine was founded here. Hammer and Lewis turns 100 this year. Luis Valdez, the founder of Teatro Campesino and the producer of La Bamba, was from here. And, uh, you know, Jose from Ziba can go on and on. And we welcome you to go on and on. And I think our homework as a community is to figure out how to document this in as many ways as we can. And with the folks wondering if there is a history book, a website or a database of the Movimiento in San Jose, um, it is a, a coordinated effort. Also know that we do have La Raza Historical Society of, of Santa Clara Valley, who does aim to um, do some of that work in terms of finding, identifying, and also documenting that history. So our work is cut out for us. We are in no way done, not just with the telling, but also with making those stories and those testimonials accessible and rightly so. Mm -hmm. So thank you folks for bringing in those perspectives. Um, I, I do- just, I just wanna say one thing. Yeah. I just wanna say one thing. We talk about the historical society. Thank you so much for that organization because they have a house. They now have a house, a Chicano house of our history at H History Park San Jose. So, you know, I don't know when they're open but you can go online and try to see when you can visit. And it's, it has, it's gonna create a lot of our history there in this area, because a lot of times we write about LA and you know San Jose isn't the focus, but we have done a lot of work here and we need to continue to do that work. And I don't think we're limited by the pandemic. We have had caravan drives for food for farm workers. We have, we're, we've gotten them hoodies. We're, you know, we're doing things for, for farm workers and other people who are struggling with food, et cetera. We're not limited with what we can do and we should continue to make sure that we do that work. Thank you. And it's more, it's very important to get involved politically, to get out that vote so that we can change this country to be a better country. Thank you, Maestra Shirley, exactly. We do have some recaps in terms of a call to action that we're going to close off with in a bit. If you are interested in learning more, engaging more, participating more, uh, helping in the effort to document that history, you can check out larasahs.org online, or you can reach out to me as the current VP in that mitote that's very necessary for the times. Um, and we are trying to engage some uh, folks from the younger generation so that we can carry on this work and learn about that history and also serve as a bridge to share that with other folks. So it's a, a community effort as it's always been um, for our gente here in San Jose. And what I'd like to do at this time because of time is to thank the language justice interpreter Alejandra Esparza for doing the live presentation and rolling with the translations in this amazing event. We wanna thank Lisa Castellanos, activist, organizer and founder of Taller Girasol, screen print art and solidarity arts organization based out of the School of Arts and Culture at the Mexican Heritage Plaza. Uh, she's been managing the chat and making sure that we have our eyeballs on the comments and questions that you all are putting in there and, and connecting with us um, on. She's been in the background the entire time and it's, it's hard work to multitask like that. And we'd also like to thank Brenda Rodriguez who did the Spanish speaking marketing material for the event. The tech team, Jose Villarreal, Fernando Perez, Carlos Velasquez, Adriana Garcia and the planning committee Elisa, Adrián, Señora María Citlalmina, Guillermo, Lisa was on that committee también, as well as several others who helped get this effort started, including María Yepes, Víctor Vázquez, the Black Berets for Justice, Paul Soto, Conexión, Centro Chico Mostoc, Barrio Defense Committee, Taller Girasol, and all of our babies and families for their patience in the background while we gather in this space and take in some of that rich history. Um, for the folks wondering where you can get a recording of this event, it is my understanding that Maiz is live streaming and will continue to restream a continue, continued feed. 
uh, make sure that you connect with Maíz de San Jose. We'll also do our best as collaborating organizations uh, with everybody's names listed here to reshare that information as well to make it accessible. And in closing, what I would like to do is hand over the Zoom microphone to La Señora Maria Citlalmina Ortiz, um, because we do have some action items that we want to make you aware of and bring our attention to. So Maestra Maria Citlalmina Ortiz, por favor y gracias. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this uh, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, countdown of the history of, of our beautiful Raza. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful to hear about the struggles that have gone on in San Jose, Califatslan, you know, and that uh, one thing that I must, you know, pass on is uh, what the Chicano movement has taught us is that we have to continue to self-determine our lives in every way possible because we are a people that have a long history of struggle for 500 years and that and that struggle continues on so um i welcome people to participate because we have a lot of work to do we have you know um different uh um i would say attacks against our raza we have many of our gente that are in these concentration camps that we have to free you know uh we have to deal with the uh, the the fire, the uh, the uh, poverty that exists uh, within our people, the discrimination, the exploitation. We have to deal with this uh, COVID nineteen that's killing our gente. So uh, you know, um, there and it's purposely done because after all, we're fifty million within the occupied territories. We're a uh, uh, the the biggest uh, number of raza are Chicano Mexicano, so they have to deal with us in the military force, and we have to you know go out there and organize our gente, you know, to defend ourselves and to remember that this is our land. This stolen land will always be our land. It is in our memory, and it will always be in our memory. Gracias, Tierra y Libertad. Uh, One thing that I must tell you is that I hope that you can mention that the, the San Jose uh, Chicano Moratorium Concilio is uh, will continue organizing. We have various uh, you know events. We have another event that's coming on on the 19th of September. And it will continue, and hopefully, you will join us. Tierra y Libertad. Tierra y Libertad. Gracias, Señora Maria Citlalmina Ortiz, for that beautiful call to action. And for our audience here, we've reached the end of our, our platica, but again, the work continues. The conversations will continue online and offline. There are so many events that you have been invited to be a part of and events that you are already a part of. So please do connect in both directions. The Maí San Jose page is holding a lot of this information as, as an archive of sorts. And we have a lot of partnering organizations also resharing that information. And again, in solidarity with the work of National Headquarters for the Chicano Moratorium, make sure you, you find the Facebook link on the chat here. Um, a few other things that you can get involved with will also be shared by way of the chat and the Facebook page, um, along with links for further reading and research to explore this particular theme and beyond the exploration to also be active in this theme and to speak out. And, you know, just like we saw a lot of our maestras and a lot of our uh, maestros here in this space talk about how you know, when there was chaos, they still stopped to help pick up other people. And it's about that community care and that we show up in that way for each other. So please do save the date for that second event. Um, because again, a lot of you are hungry for more. And we'll ask if we can share the chat string as well. 
Uh, we do want to put some more announcements on that chat string. I think we've announced people out by way of the of the platica. It's a lot of information that is beautiful um, and yet beautifully overwhelming. And so be a part of the movement. We've always had a movement here in San Jose. We'll continue to have movements here in San Jose. And we want to also thank the San Jose Chicano Moratorium Resistance Council. Again, to Citlalmina Maria, Adrián Guillermo, Lisa, Adriana, all the individuals such as Brenda, Carlos, and Lisa. Oh, what?